A Failure to Fuel. This video provides you with an example of the dynamic between a narcissist and the intimate partner primary source surrounded by non-intimate secondary sources and where there is a failure to fuel. It demonstrates the nature of the dynamic and the response of the relevant narcissist. It provides you with an example of wounding, how this is a failure to fuel, how this threatens control, and the response of the narcissist within this given situation. A failure to fuel. Do that again, and you'll regret it. Those are the words which will be spoken in about five minutes, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Welcome to the narcissist's court. Here he sits, sat at his rightful place at the head of the table, prominent, elevated, and overseer of those that have been magnanimously invited to look upon him and bask in their admiration of his glory. He sits fork in one hand and knife in the other. There is food on the plate, but he pays it no regard because he didn't prepare it. Instead, the narcissist is smiling, that rich, bountiful smile of the generous ruler that he is, as he allows his subjects to draw close to him and experience a fragment of what it is like to be as brilliant as he. He knows he is brilliant, because right now the flames of power are high and bright inside of him. They are strong, they are intense, and the power that they imbue is washing back and forth over him, causing his rictus grin to become affixed to his face. He could not remove this smile, even if he wanted to, because it has been plastered there by the power that is coursing through him. This power is edifying and invigorating, twisting flames which dart and climb inside of him so that he feels as if he is taking off. The narcissist has to fight to remain in his seat as he wants to leap onto the table, booted feet scattering plates and glasses, as he allows this power to overwhelm him and surge towards a higher place. And thus empowered, he will speak to those assembled and dazzle them. The mind races, thoughts fighting with one another. He sees the smiling faces, the open mouths denoting laughter. He can hear the delight and amusement that he has caused amongst his dinner guests. He did that. He had all eyes on him. Those eyes widening with interest and adoration as he regaled his anecdote to the guests. Each focused pair of eyes, the expressions of concentration, the rapt attention that was flowing his way. The mouths closed, set silent, not daring to, nor needing to interrupt him, all demonstrated that he was the sole attraction, that he mattered. He had control of the room. Each and every appliance sat around that table was under control. As his eyes looked from face to face, never truly distinguishing who each person was, he drank in the fuel. It was not the recognition of who those people were, but rather the emotions that he could see, hear, and sense. Each look of admiration, each closed mouth which told him that the floor was his, and that they had no need to interrupt, as they wanted to listen, from each of the people sat around the table, caused fuel to flow from those non-intimate secondary sources, just as he wanted. Here, in his court, sat on his throne. He is surrounded by lieutenants and members of the coterie. The inner circle individuals, who are supportive, respectful and loyal to him, because they know how fortunate they are to be associated with him, their laughter, delight and admiration flows around the room like fuel in a tank, and he wants it all. How wonderful this power is, how it enables him to shine and dazzle, so he receives even more of this precious resource. He nods slowly in recognition, almost able to see the pipelines which lead from each guest to him. 
He can picture the golden sparkling fuel as it is pumped towards him, ready to feed those flames of power. And then he sees it. Your pipeline is empty. Nothing flows along it. This is when he sees that you are not laughing, you are not even smiling at his entertaining recollection. Instead, you stare ahead, showing nothing, as he delivered the flourish of the conclusion to the tale. In that instant, the flames become doused, they are snuffed out, and suddenly the power that they created is starting to ebb, and he can feel himself falling, sinking, and then that sensation of unease begins to spread from the centre of the chest and radiating outwards. You are sat there, seemingly unmoved by his anecdote, but not only that, you have chosen to signal to him that not only does it not entertain you, but it didn't do anything for you at all. He can feel the wound caused by that lack of response. It pains him, evidence of the challenge that you have sent his way, unjustified and unwarranted. Then it happens. The ignition of fury as the spark is set. The rage begins to climb inside of him. He can feel its effect, trying to twist his face into a snarl, but he has to control it. The facade matters. Important members of the facade are right here, and it would not do to explode as he feels like he must do, and let them know what you have done. The narcissist wants to pick up this crystal glass and hurl it from his end of the table to your end so it strikes you on the forehead and knocks you from your seat. He wants to smash a plate over your head, but he must control these manifestations of the fury that is rising inside of him. He knows that he can. He has done it many times before. Nobody else has seen your treacherous behaviour, and the narcissist manages to shift his blackening gaze from you to the lady to his left, and she is continuing to smile. Yes, smile for me, Helen. Smile. Yes. Good. That was hilarious. I love your stories, she remarks as she cuts at the meat on her plate. He feels the power returning from this fuel that Helen has provided to him. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. I knew I could rely on you. Yes, and you as well, Tom. Good, sweet Tom, who never fails to laugh at anything that the narcissist says, and is still doing so. The narcissist feels the rage being beaten back by this additional fuel, which continues to power the narcissist. He blinks twice, caught between the receding fury and the gathering power from the newly revisited fuel. The power begins to wash over the narcissist again, as he avoids looking at the traitor and keeps drinking from the fuel from the friends, the good, kind and loyal friends. They know what to do. They would not betray the narcissist, not like you. He is beginning to wonder why he even bothered with you now. It's not as if you contribute much over dinner anyway. He would have thought that you would have realised that it is your role to support him and allow him to shine, but you seem not to want to do that, do you? He doesn't know why. It's not as if he hasn't been kind to you. Too kind, maybe. Perhaps you need reminding of why you exist. Yes, a prompt reminder is called for. The narcissist would cut you down right now with a scything comment, but that would fracture the facade. After all, nobody saw what you did, and the narcissist is not so stupid as to do something which damages everybody's favourable impression of him. No. His acidic tongue, although itching to lash out at you, for the fury remains, albeit diminishing, will stay still in his mouth at this dinner table. He continues to drink in the fuel, once again feeling powerful, emboldened and engorged. He can tell that Helen is interested in him, and why not? Perhaps a promotion is on the cards for her, moving her from inner circle friend to intimate partner, and perhaps, in turn, installation's primary source. She would relish the opportunity. The narcissist has no doubt about that. Everybody wants to be with him. The narcissist is forced to put consideration of a personal change to one side, as he sees you, the traitor, leave the table and head towards the kitchen. Here, 
comes his chance. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. The narcissist smiles again as he stands. All eyes swing his way again, expectation dancing in them. I have some more wine for you, something extra special. This prompts a cheer, and the fuel flows further for the narcissist at this delighted reaction to his largesse. The flames are climbing now, as he leaves the table and the chatter of the guests behind and enters the kitchen, where the traitor is about to pick up the tiered cake that the traitor has created for pudding. The traitor whips around as soon as she senses the narcissist's presence, and her eyes are round as she has anticipated what is coming. Good, thinks the narcissist, you recognise my greatness, and it does not create defiance, but rather uncertainty and fear. The narcissist can see the concern etched across her face. Do that again, and you know what will happen, he says slowly. His eyes staring straight into those of the traitor, the gaze impenetrable and darkening. She shrinks back as the narcissist looms over her. Her response causes the flames to rise even further as the negative fuel pumps from this appliance. The fear and apprehension, just what was required. Do what? She replies. A challenge lies in those words. Don't fucking lie to me, hisses the narcissist. And this makes the victim jump. That reaction causes the flames to lick a little higher. I don't know what you mean, she protests. She is rooted to the spot, but leaning away from the narcissist, even this body language fueling him as it displays her obvious unease. Yes, you do. How dare you fucking not react to my story? He presses. I did react. Are you saying I'm making it up? No, no, no. I just... Um... She starts to flounder. Caught between wanting to cling to the truth, truth seeker that she is, and cautious of enraging the narcissist further. Just what? Spit it out! The narcissist commands. I, uh... The narcissist wants to smile as he delights in her apprehension and the simple exhibition of his power over her. In an instant, he has drawn negative fuel from her and stunned her into confused silence. Pa, indeed. Well, he urges, he is enjoying this. Pa, fuel, control. N nothing. I'm sorry. I must have been distracted by something else. I have a lot on my mind with work, you know. Um, I'll push it to one side and enjoy the evening. I I'm so sorry. The apology strengthens the flames. The narcissist holds her gaze a little longer as her eyes flick from the left eye to the right eye, as if to expect to find some kind of approval or forgiveness in them. You better had, the narcissist says softly as he continues to look at her. Otherwise, the voice trails off, and the narcissist extends the forefinger on his left hand and slowly and deliberately pushes it into the sponge of the cake, the digit driving into the yielding cake. The victim's eyes stare at the gesture as her mouth tightens in fear. The narcissist removes his finger, leaving a deep and obvious indentation in the top of the cake as he licks his finger clean and continues to stare at the victim and waits. The victim nods. There is the compliance and submission to control that the narcissist sought. The fuel flows, and now the narcissist can turn and return to the waiting admirers, having ensured that the victim understands who is the master and who is the servant. No raised voices. No smashed plates. No slamming doors. Facade maintained. Fuel obtained. Control imposed. This is what happens when there is a failure to fuel.